Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Gary and uh, I've been running this webinar series on formative assessment in action. So this is the, the third one um, and uh, I've called it in action because this one will be very much some of the, the tips and techniques around formative assessment and how it can support the, the learning process. So just as a bit of a review, um, with, with all feedback, it should link back to the learning outcomes and the, the success criteria. So today I'm going to talk about feedback practice and the contribution that can make to inclusive learning environments. Um, there's nothing big and spectacular. There's absolutely nothing that's new in formative assessment. The purpose of it has been around for, for a long time. Um, but I think the main principle of formative assessment, as with all types of assessment, is that it moves learning forward and makes the learner aware of the of the progress that, that they have that they have made and allows them to, to look forward to see what they have to do to consolidate and strengthen that learning. And feedback practice and contribution to reflective and interdependent learning. Those of you who have signed in for the other webinars will know I have a kind of thing about the concept of independent learning. Um, I think as part of the learning process there are three stages in getting to that independent stage. I think when students first come to us, um, many of them are totally dependent on us and as we go through the programme and with the help of the, the lecturer, the teacher and the others in the group, they get to an interdependent stage and some of them get to the independent stage and, and you know that happens when they can transfer the concepts that you've learned into to new situations. So that's, that's where we're going today. Um, the success criteria for the webinar this afternoon is that you'll know at least one thing you didn't know before about formative assessment in action and identify one thing you'll change about your practice on leaving the session if you are in fact working with people um, in, in the direct learning environment. Um, so that's that's the success criteria and that's where we'll end at the, uh, at the end of the, the session today. But let's get the dialogue started um, using the chat box. Um, we've got four. So what's the most positive work-related experience or result achieved today? And uh, I'll include my own as well, I have to say. So if you could just maybe think about that for a moment and give me some feedback in the chat box. Thank you, Kerry. And I've just realised that while I was typing, I forgot to mute my microphone, so you probably heard the keyboard. Um, my technical expert, my technical wizard, George, was probably trying to get my attention to tell me, but so my apologies. I will remember next time. Thanks, Neil. When you see the penny has dropped. Oh, well done you to here. Completed the plan for 30 National 5 webinars. Whoop, whoop. That's great. And a really nice piece of feedback there related to a particular student from Lindsay there. Fantastic. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. And uh, we'll just move on then. Okay, um, just as a bit of a, a review, again, that's a formative assessment um, technique in action where we preview and review. Um, in previous webinars, we talked about what exactly is formative assessment. And I said it's a natural and intuitive part of the learning process. And it takes place when you're working directly with the students and it reinforces and, and strengthens the learning. And equally important is that formative assessment tips and techniques through basic questioning techniques encourages the higher order and critical thinking skills. Um, big push on higher order and critical thinking skills um, in schools and colleges. Um, it's a key part of Curriculum for Excellence uh, approaches and of course the new national qualifications we are encouraging students at all levels of study to be more reflective and, and critical and uh, we need to think about well how, how on earth do we actually do that as part of, of the learning environment and uh, hopefully I'll give you some ideas as, as we move through the session. So when giving feedback then, uh, I just wanted to, to flag up a couple of things. Um, whoever's giving the feedback, whether it's the lecturer, the teacher, or indeed the student 
um, giving feedback to their peers. You have to be a pretty skilled operator and certainly my work that I've been supporting colleagues through uh, teaching qualifications, I found out you really have to be a skilled operator to, to give high quality feedback that doesn't just impact on the work that, that people are, are submitting, but actually brings about a change in, in the person. And uh, I think that's the case with all learning, whatever shape and form it takes. There has to be a recognisable change, not just in the work, but in the person. And that's about you know, the change in the person being a bit more reflective, a um, bit more evaluative, and actually having a go can do attitude. Um, you have to focus on the stuff, and uh, that's one of my favourite words uh, for educational jargon. You have to focus on the stuff that can be changed. Certainly all teachers and lecturers are pretty skilled at doing that. And if you're trying to um, develop reflective and critical higher order thinking skills, formative assessment and action, I would suggest, is the best tool in the box. And it is just a toolbox. So what do we know about attainment? Um, certainly the Scottish Government is obsessed at the moment with um, raising attainment. Um, they talk about closing the attainment gap. Um, I'm not a, a huge fan of that concept, cl closing the attainment gap. Uh, this is a personal opinion. I'm very much about bridging the attainment gap. And in the previous webinar, I talked about you know, how formative assessment is, is a bridge, getting your student from where they are and where you want them to be. But there are three or four basic things that teachers, lecturers, and our, our, our colleagues from external organisations are very clear about things that raise attainment. And what right at the top, I would suggest, is the quality first teaching environments. Um, the learning environment is a huge part of, of successful learning. We know that when people are thinking critically or developing with higher order skills and really thinking about their work, that that can raise attainment. And also, uh, involving learners in the whole process. And I think that's a real part of formative assessment in action. And again, I've got about half a dozen tips and techniques for developing that learner involvement. And finally, we all know that learning is a social process and that we need to have learning conversations, um, learning chats. Uh, I think in educational jargon, it's called the learning dialogues. But I think learning conversations, discussions is, is much more readily understandable. Um, I think there's about 12 things we already know about how we can raise attainment. But thinking about formative assessment in action, I think that these are probably the four ones that I would, I would suggest are critical to help us bridge um, attainment and develop the, the reflective interdependent students that we, that we strive for. So um, again, I'm going to pause for thought and uh, just a couple of statements. Um, I love statement cards. Um, that's one of the, the tips and techniques that I use to get people to think, whether individually or in pairs and groups. Um, I'm just going to mute my microphone and in the chat box, just ask you to post your immediate reaction to the statement below. And it's as it says on the tin, on the whole, feedback can be a mainly negative experience for most students. Um, just take a moment to pause and uh, put your thoughts in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry, uh, Yolanda and Neil. Some interesting things there. And Lindsay. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think I would agree with, with all of these. And the tip and technique of formative assessment in action was just to model um, a, a statement whereby you can think about it individually, also pairs and, and also in groups. I'm a huge fan of uh, statement cards, particularly when introducing new concepts to the students, because it helps me get an understanding of what they already know, or indeed what they don't know, and then I can adjust my learning and teaching um, accordingly. But I certainly agree with one or two things that, yeah, we tend to, to focus on the mainly negative. Certainly, if I've been delivering staff training and development, if I get really nice comments, but uh, the one that jumps out at me is usually the negative one, and uh, think, oh, you know, 
beat myself up about that. But yeah, so it depends on the type of feedback. Thank you. Yeah, Neil said it can only, student only wants to know what is wrong, not what is right. Yeah, they just see that that one where it's it's seen as a criticism. Okay, and Tahir, yeah, um, formative assessment and action. It's very much about stressing the strengths first and then looking at the development needs. Okay, um, just one more pause for thought. And again, it's a statement, just to model the statement card exercise. Um, again, just take a moment to think about the statement below. Students often give and receive criticism of their work more freely than in the traditional lecturer or teacher student interchange. So what's your immediate reaction to my statement below? Yes, Neil, thanks for, for that. Yes, um, if they're doing peer evaluation or peer reflection, thank you. Yep. Okay, I can see people are busy typing and the responses are coming out now. Okay, um, Neil says, I think it depends on the group dynamics. I'd absolutely agree. Um, in the previous webinar about formative assessment, I said it will depend on the quality of the relationships that you have with the group. And certainly you have to teach the skills of self-assessment before you go anywhere near peer assessment. So I would certainly agree with Neil. Yolanda says, I don't know what you mean by the traditional lecturer-student interchange. Yes, what I meant by that is that the feedback is always the process between the lecturer or the teacher and the student, rather than student to student, where they have a, a chance to have a structured um, discussion. Um, so I hope that clears that up, Yolanda. Uh, Lindsay, they also want to compare their results and like the praise from their peers. Yes, I think that's really important, um, and I'll pick up on that in a moment. Yeah, a little more freely if they're encouraged to think that way. Yeah, it does take a lot of um, preparation to get them to that stage where they can do that level of reflection and evaluation without saying horrible things to each other. And Tahir says, I don't think many students feel comfortable with sharing their work with other students. Yeah, that can be the case too. They, they maybe feel a wee bit exposed. Um, so thank you for all these excellent contributions. Um, I was working with a group of NC photography students uh, just before the Easter holidays there. And uh, the session that I was involved in was they were showcasing their um, assessment of the brief that they had been given and the photographs that they're taking um, to evidence a range of techniques. And the lecturer who was leading the session did a fabulous job when he um, set it up. It was very relaxed. It was very comfortable. And they obviously very comfortable with the whole process had been part of, of the program. Um, and what the lecturer did was he appointed peers to, to give feedback. And actually, what was so fantastic was that once the student had presented their image and talked about all the technical um, bits that they had to, to do, the positive feedback from the peers was amazing. There were spontaneous applause. It was just really nice to be part of that whole um, feedback in, in action um, piece, uh, session that I, I was involved in. And then the lecturer came in with his feedback complementing the points that the students had picked out and then giving his feedback from a more knowledgeable perspective or viewpoint. It was just beautifully done. It was absolutely fabulous. And it was just a nice example of students actually getting a lot from the feedback from the students themselves, rather than just the usual process of the teacher lecturer giving feedback to the student. It was beautifully done, and it was just a joy to be part of, of that. And the, the confidence and the self-esteem, I think I was almost drowning in positivity. It was, it was so good. Okay, many thanks for that. Uh, let's let's move on. So, how is formative assessment, the power of feedback, how is it inclusive? Well, this is quite a difficult one, and uh, I will. I, I forgot to ask George to upload this to the document, but there's a fabulous publication that was 
uh, produced by the Higher Education Academy in June 2004. It's a wee bit dated now, it's 13 years old, um, but I, I do think it's it's probably the best kind of professional piece of literature that I've read on a formative assessment and it's called Enhancing Student Learning Through Effective Formative Feedback and my webinar series has, has very much been based on 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 the content of, of that paper and also the observations from working in, in college. Um, but it doesn't go into how is it inclusive. So um, this is not highlighted in the paper, but uh, I will be sending this to our events team uh, tomorrow and Caitlin will send you the paper or the link to the paper because it really is fabulous. Um, so how is it inclusive then? Um, well, formative assessment in action is very much it's focused on success and improvement, the absolute points that are appearing in the chat box there. Um, it also is an opportunity for individual and group accountability as well. It's almost this sink or swim together, and I think it develops cooperation as well as the collaboration and, and the, the participation. So I think that does contribute to a more inclusive learning environment. It does have an impact on confidence and self esteem. As Neil said, it depends on the dynamics of the group and how you've prepared that for the group, but I certainly saw a huge positive impact on confidence and self-esteem um, on the evaluation that was going on, the peer evaluation as well as the lecturer evaluation and the photography session. I'm delighted to be going back tomorrow to see that group doing doing a similar type of, of exercise. It will be interesting to see um, if it's still as positive as the last one. Um, it provides good techniques for discussing and comparing, particularly if it's met the, the outcomes or if it's met the success criteria. It can develop goal sharing amongst members of the group. And I think the big inclusive statement there is that everyone can contribute. So I think formative assessment in action as part of the learning process and the group dynamics is certainly uh, an, indi an indication of how inclusive we can be in our learning environment. Uh, but that's just me. There are other viewpoints available, but that's how I think it can promote inclusive educational practice. So what about reflective and interdependent learning? Um, here are some tips and techniques. I think I picked up on one or two of these in the other two webinars. But uh, some some tips and techniques, again, that the McFarlane paper does pick up on, and I've tried with groups of students with varying degrees of success. But certainly one tip and technique is to ask the students themselves, what kind of feedback do they find most useful? What's their most favoured type of feedback? That can be absolutely fascinating. Um, as I think Lindsay said, you identify the strengths and development needs. Tahir said that as well. Um, reflecting on achievements and selection of work. Um, again, what I mean by this, for example, the, the photography group that I'm working with at the moment in, in a college, they're actually selecting um, images for their portfolio. So they're reflecting on the technical achievements as well as the aesthetic achievements, and they're discussing the criteria and selecting the work for their photography portfolio. And again, it just seemed to work um, beautifully. Um, again, formative assessment in action can uh, assist with goal setting and milestone setting and uh, lots about peer feedback. Again, I don't want to, to labour that one in this webinar because we did lots of that in the, the previous two. So um, moving on then, in action. Um, so what does it look like in action when we're working as part of the, the, the learning process? Um, I like one minute papers or two minute papers. And uh, when I'm working with my students or my groups, whether they're adult returners or whether they're younger students or whether I'm working with colleagues in the sector, I like to stop when I'm uh, instructing or demonstrating or doing a presentation. And I'll suddenly stop and I'll say to them, what was the main point of the input or what was the main point of what Gary was saying for the last 10 or 15 minutes? Um, and I also like, as a one minute paper, I like to say at the end of a session, um, What's the big burning question for you at the end of this session? What's still exercising your your, your mind? Um, so I like one minute papers. And again, it's as simple as dropping into 
uh, just stopping and say what's the most interesting, relevant, or what's the most worthwhile thing or the main point of the last 10 uh, to 12 minutes. So I'm a great fan of one minute papers. If you're working with younger students, it actually keeps them quite focused as well because they actually know that I'm going to stop at some point and, and ask and it'll give me a lot of feedback to myself as to just how, how well they have been listening. Um, I sometimes get my students to identify a question worth asking. And I love this. Um, I get them to come up with, with a question. And uh, so I'm going to try that now. Um, I'm not going to ask you to, to uh, identify a question, but I'm going to set you a question. And uh, again, it's about reframing the questions. I did a lot about reframing questions. Um, so I'm just going to ask the question. It's not a pause for thought. Um, so I'll pose this question. You might not think it's worth asking, but I think it's a fine example of citizenship and sustainability. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question and then just take a pause for thought and uh, I'll see what comes back in the chat box. So the question is, why is plastic a good material for modern toys? Why is plastic a good material for modern toys? And the reason why I ask it is because I was working with a... Thanks, Lindsay. I don't think I can add anything to that. <laughs> I think you've got everything there. Interesting, Neil. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yep, inexpensive and recyclable. Um, yeah, I think it does have potential for recycling, but Neil's maybe questioning that, that that's maybe not sustainable de, uh, depending on the quality. Um, interesting. Um, again, I was working with a group of students who were uh, doing uh, mental health uh, as, as a focus and uh, the lecturer who I was working with asked a fantastic question, a question worth, worth asking, and they were focusing on drugs and the question which got the group discussing, it was just a nice formative assessment in, in action technique, and the question was, all drugs are bad for you, agree, disagree, and say why, and the the, the content that the, the lecturer got back was, was just amazing. So I like identifying a question worth asking. Um, another one is talking partners, discussing and comparing quality of, of, of the success criteria or, or what they have produced. But I also like talking partners, and I, I do this when I'm, I'm working with teachers and lecturers. Um, I'll just get them to take a couple of minutes, a one minute or a two minute paper, just to discuss something with their shoulder partner or their, their talking um, partner. I mean, it's structured. It's not just anything. But uh, it's, again, it's also good, good for focused discussion. And uh, But certainly when we're looking at maybe assessment um, instruments or assessment methods or what the success criteria, um, it's quite nice for, for for discussing and comparing quality of the work that's, that's been produced. Um, Another two techniques which um, come from the United States, and it's part of critical thinking skills program. And the reason why I've included this, because certainly in all the literature around curriculum for excellence and developing the four capacities, there's a big emphasis on developing higher order and, and, and critical thinking skills. And uh, snowballing and, and envoying. Um, I like snowballing as, as, a, as a questioning technique, um, but there are two two Two, two types of snowballing. I mean, if I'm asking direct questions to students and I don't get the answer I want, I might snowball it to someone else and say, can you help Gary out or is there anything you can add or what do you think of that answer? But generally snowballing is where you have, maybe if they're working in pairs, you might ask them to join up um, to another pair so that you've got fours. You might then double it up to eight, depending on the numbers in your group, and you snowball the discussion. Um, that's rather a simplistic um, kind of summary of it, but it is really just a structured group discussion um, technique. Another one I like during theory, theory sessions is envoying, and what that means where they're working in groups, I'll ask one student or one member of the group to move, go to the next group, they've got a minute to let 
the receiving group know what their group had been discussing. And then someone from that group has to tell the envoy um, what they have been discussing. So you're almost summarising the main points, which is a good learning skill for, for the group. So certainly in theory sessions, snowballing and envoying are, are, are good techniques that I like. And it's just nice examples of, of formative assessment in in action. And that comes from the Critical Thinking Skills Programme developed in the United States. I use it because I like it. Um, and again, as Neil said, it depends on your group dynamics. I just wouldn't launch into these things. You have to know your, your, your group. Statement cards I've discussed there in earlier webinars. I've given you some statements for in the pauses for thoughts. But again, if you're introducing a brand new concept, I think statement cards are fantastic for working out what they know already and what I have to do to get them to the, to the next stage. And then think, pair, share. I might give them a statement or ask a question, get them to think, pair up with their talking partner and then share it with with the rest of, of the group. And uh, Dylan Williams, who's considered uh, to be a bit of a, an expert in the whole area of feedback and formative assessment, he's very clear that one of the biggest sins that lecturers and teachers commit is when they're, when they're asking questions is that they don't give enough thinking time. Uh, I was a wee bit sceptical at first, but I think he's right. And certainly, if we want to be more inclusive, we have to give that thinking time because, as you know, the, the range, the mix, diversity of students in front of us, they need different times to process that information. So it's, it's a real learning curve for me because I find it really hard. And when I, I trained originally as a teacher donkeys years ago, um, you know, we were taught at, at teacher training that uh, you go for the three P's approach when you're questioning. You pose, you pause, and you pounce. Um, I'm glad to say these days are gone. Um, we, we would pose the question, we would pause now, give them the thinking time, and you know what? I think it works because it gives people that processing time. So again, I'm a great fan of think, pair, and share. And uh, well, I I think that's everything I, I wanted to, to say. Um, I'm a wee bit cross with myself because I'm five minutes over, but that's okay. Um, you contributed really well. So I'm going to go back to my success criteria. And uh, it was know at least one thing you didn't know before about formative assessment in action. And identify one thing you will change about your practice on leaving this session. So I would like you to to think and I would like you to share and I'm going to give you some processing time and um, if you could share with me anything you know you didn't know before or one thing that you might do in the future so I'm just going to mute my microphone and see what comes into the chat box thank you Thank you, Kerry. Um, I bet you do use them. Um, I bet you just don't have fancy terms like I do that I call them snowballing and envoying. Well, they're not my terms. They're from the US critical th thinking skills. So thank you for that. But that's good that I've highlighted a few techniques for you. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, there you go. Snowballing. Yeah. So much easier to say than, than developing your assessment techniques. Just say, I snowball. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Yeah, give them thinking time. Um, I think, as I said, um, formative assessment is something that's been so well researched in, in educational practice. And, you know, we it's something that teachers and lecturers do naturally and intuitively. But there are basic techniques that we can all do that we probably are already doing, but possibly need a wee bit more development. So thank you. Thanks to here, the snowballing techniques. Yeah. And what I will do is um, I'll make sure that Caitlin sends the paper that I really like. It's got the seven principles of feedback and formative assessment. And it won't put you to sleep. It's a really good read. 
And what's quite nice is that it links up to our professional standards in the college sector, uh, very much about understanding the principles of assessment. And one principle of assessment is indeed formative assessment and how that moves learning forward and allows students to become more reflective and aware of their own pro progress. Thank you, Kerry. And Yolanda's going to leave a message. Uh, thank you, Yolanda. That's great. OK, um, that's the formal input. Um, as I say, you'll be able to download the presentation if you find it useful. And I'll ask our events coordinator to make sure that we get the McFarlane paper to you, hopefully by the end of the week.